Good morning. Welcome this morning to worship at Grace Congregational United Church of Christ. We are so glad that you are here with us as we worship God together. I see Joshua coming up for an announcement. Thank you. Um, know that during our worship service, we will be celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion together. Uh, here on the baptismal font is gluten-free bread, which will stay here in the middle if that is what you need. Josh. Morning, everybody. I'm the only announcement this morning so I can talk as long as I want, right? Just kidding. <laughs> So good morning, my name is Joshua Willis and I'm here with a message from the diaconate to save the date, mark your calendars for rally day on September 12th this year, less than a month away. Uh, please keep in mind that we'll be looking for entries into our pie and baked goods auction that's gonna be held after service that day. But for now we're in need of bingo prizes. Um, some ideas are gently used items from your home, crafts, uh, small gift cards, maybe a couple dollars or a free ice cream cone, something like that. Other fun items in the one to five dollar range. Uh, there's a box by the information desk uh, to put these in. So remember rally day, September 12th, and mark your calendars. We look forward to seeing you there. Thanks. Thank you, Joshua. Couple more announcements um, on behalf of the church. One is that we are hiring Right now we are looking for a new leader for our high school youth group. Um, as many of you know, Nicole Herta served in that position very faithfully for lots and lots of years. She has stepped down from that position as she continues um, her work through seminary school and um, probably we think this time next year or so we'll be serving her own church as a pastor. So she's stepping back from um, her staff position here, though she'll stay a member of our congregation as she continues her studies. So in any case, um, we are hiring to find a leader for our youth group. There are um, green sheets like this out on the information desk. If you are interested, if you know somebody who you think might be good for it, um, grab a sheet. There's more description on here of what we're looking for. Um, this is a paid position, uh, something like six hours a week. Um, so there's more information here, uh, or please talk to me. If you're interested, come talk to me. If you're not sure if you're interested but curious to learn more, um, let me know and I would be happy to tell you more about it. Um, the other thing just to make note of is that uh, a member of our congregation, Jim Taylor, who is one of our, um, not necessarily oldest members, but uh, longest term members. He joined the church in 1947. Um, he is right near the end of his life. Um, so we offer prayers uh, for him, um, for his family, including uh, his daughter, Joyce Tomey, is also a member of our congregation. Um, so keep, please keep them in uh, your hearts and your prayers um, this morning as we worship. Let us now prepare our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and our souls for the worship of God.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God be with you. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time for anger and a time for contentment. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time for movement and a time for stillness. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time for control and a time for chaos. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time for lament and a time for praise. God has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, God has put a sense of past and future into our minds. Yet we cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe. That which is already has been. That which is to be already is. And God seeks out what has gone by. In all seasons, in all times, God is with us. If it is true that God has recorded our failings, we hope it will never be published. But in truth, if the book were opened, every page would be blank. For for God forgives us of everything we have done or failed to do. So let us wait for God's mercy and grace as we come with our prayers for forgiveness. We know that we are set free by your saving grace, generous God. Yet we must confess how we are still bound by our own pride and arrogance. 
We struggle to remove the grave clothes of our habitual sin, finding them too comfortable to wear. We cling tightly to our fears, for they are so familiar and make such good companions. Yet in every corner of our lives, in every shadow we fear, into the cold embrace of death itself, you come, O God of steadfast love. You break the bonds of sin and terror, giving us new strength and hope for the journey, and calling us to the freedom of new life through the love and sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You can put your hope in God, dear friends, for God offers us that love which never ends, that life which never ends. We wait for God, and God does not fail us. God's hope, God's love, and God's grace are forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. In Psalm 30, the psalmist describes a point in their life when they co lived confidently, believing nothing would ever go wrong. But then something terrible happened, which left them shaking and grieving. In the end, the psalmist praises God for bringing them through that grief and into a time of real joy. Please pray with me. I exalt you, Lord, because you pulled, pulled me up. You didn't let my enemies celebrate over me. Lord, Lord my, my God, God I, I cried, cried out for, for you to help, help and, and you, you healed, healed me. me. Lord, you brought me up from the grave, brought me back to life from among those going down to the pit. You, you, you are, are faithful, faithful to, to the, the Lord, Lord sing, sing praises, praises. Give, give thanks, thanks to God's, God's holy name. name. God's anger lasts only for a second, but God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping, Weeping may, may stay, stay all night, night but, but by, by morning, morning joy. joy. When I was comfortable, I said, I will never stumble. Because, because I pleased you, Lord, you made me a strong mountain. mountain. But then, then you hid your presence. presence. I, I was, was terrified. terrified. I cried out to you, Lord. I begged my Lord for mercy. What, what is, is to be gained by my spilled blood, by my what going down, down to the pit? pit? Does dust thank you? Does it proclaim your faithfulness? Lord, listen and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You changed my mourning into dancing. You took off my funeral clothes and dressed me up in joy so that my whole being might sing praises to you and never stop. Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Thank you, Owen. I would like to invite for the children who are present with us. Come on up and join me. Come on up, boys. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming to church today. How are you? Good. How are you, Owen? Are you good? That's okay. That's okay. All right, so our scripture that we just read said something about um, talking to God and saying to God, you changed my mourning into dancing. You know what dancing is, right? Do a little dance. Do you know what mourning means here? There's two meanings for the word mourning. I bet you know one of them, right? What does, what does mourning mean? 
What is the morning? Exactly, the beginning of the day, right? The sun rises, we wake up, it's morning. It's a time in the day, right? That's one meaning of the word morning. But here when we say, you changed my morning into dancing, we're talking about a different kind of morning. There's a second meaning for that same word, and it means when we're really sad. When we're, like something has happened, and we are really, really sad about that thing that happened. Can you think of anything in your life, Andrew, that made you really, really sad? Maybe not off the top of your head, but I bet if you thought about it for a minute, even you might be able to think of something. Sometimes we think of mourning like when someone we love has died, then, then we say we're mourning. Or it could just be something else sad that happens if we um, really wanted to go visit a friend and then we couldn't, or if someone we know is sick, or if something bad happens in our day, we can be mourning about those things too. So we're saying to God, you took my mourning, you took my really, really sad feeling, and you turned it into dancing. God can take our sad feelings and turn them around and help us feel happy again. That's what we're talking about in the psalm. So I have a song that I'm going to teach all of us, so I'm going to need you guys' help for this one too, okay? Can you get me the first slide of the song words there, Shelby? There we go. Okay, so this is how it goes at the beginning. It goes, you changed my morning, my morning, my morning into dancing. All right? So it goes like this. I'll sing it once and then invite you guys to sing it with me. Okay? Let me get the tune in my head. Hold on just a second. Okay, here we go. You changed my morning, my morning, my morning into dancing. Join me. You changed my morning, my morning, my morning into dancing. Again, you changed my morning, my morning, my morning into dancing. One more time. You changed my morning, my morning, my morning into dancing. Okay, that's the first part. And the second part goes like this. You change, why don't you just repeat the words after me the, the first time. You changed my sorrow into song. You changed my singing into praise. You changed my praise to peace. My peace to joy and dancing. Good. So it goes like this. You changed my sorrow into song. You changed my singing into praise. You changed my praise to peace, my peace to joy and dancing. Sing with me. You changed my sorrow into song. You changed my singing into praise. You changed my praise to peace, my peace to joy and dancing. Again. You changed my sorrow into song. You changed my singing into praise. You changed my praise to peace, my peace to joy and dancing. Good. Okay, so now we're going to go back to the beginning. We'll all sing the first part once. And then I'm going to invite you guys on this side of the congregation to keep singing that part again. And we'll change to the second part. Okay? We'll see if we can do it. If you feel like you don't get the second part yet, keep singing the first part. Because we need more voices on that part anyway. All right? So just keep singing the first part if you don't have the second part yet. But I'll change the second. Okay. Are we ready? All right. You changed my morning, my morning, my morning into dancing. You change my you change my sorrow into song. You change my singing into praise. You change my praise to peace, my peace to joy and dancing. 
That almost worked. <laughs> it almost worked. Good try. All right, should we pray? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for joy and for laughter, for helping us find happiness in life and laughing even at ourselves. We praise you, God, that even when hard times come, even when we're sad and grieving and mourning, that that is not the end. But you can help us find joy and happiness again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've got some flutes over there. You guys want to grab one on your way, okay? Oh. Good morning. Today we continue four week, the four-week series with Ecclesiastes 3. The teacher, who is the narrator of the book, continues to list juxtaposition pairs that define our life here on earth. There's a time for everything, the teacher says, and everything happens in its own time. Try as we might as humans, we cannot determine or control the changing times. Listen. <clears throat> Excuse me. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. This concludes the Old Testament. Thank you, Renee. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John. Many of you probably remember the story of the two sisters, Mary and Martha, that we read in the Gospel of Luke. Mary is, uh, well, I should say, both Mary and Martha are friends with Jesus, and Jesus comes to visit them. And when Jesus comes to visit them, Mary finds herself sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him talk and speaking with him. Martha runs around the house trying to get things ready, trying to cook food and, you know, clean the house and, and all the things that you have to do to prepare for a guest to come, especially a guest like Jesus. She's running around trying to get them ready. And um, she comes and scolds Mary for just sitting there and not helping her. So that's Mary and Martha as we hear about them in the Gospel of Luke. Here in John, this is a story of the same Mary and Martha. Their brother, Lazarus, has died. Although at the beginning of chapter 11 of John, he has not died yet. He is sick. And they send word to their dear friend Jesus that Lazarus is ill, very ill, and could Jesus come and heal him. But Jesus doesn't get there in time. Not unlike our story last week, Jesus doesn't get there in time for Lazarus' illness. Lazarus dies, is buried, is put in a tomb uh, for four days before Jesus arrives. And then this is what happened. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 32 through 35. Oh, and uh, one more thing, actually, before I begin the actual reading. Um, we used to have this habit, and then with everything that's happened in the last year and a half, we fell out of the habit of including in the bulletin the page numbers for the um, children's Bibles that are in the pews. So uh, if you have a child near you, or if you do um, at some service in the future, we have in the bulletin the the um, page number for this story, uh, which is page 440 in the children's Bibles. A reading from the Gospel of John. Listen for a word from God. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, Jesus was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. 
He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone away. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me, and I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you have sent me. And when Jesus had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary had seen what Jesus did and believed in him. Will you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Just recently... I was meeting with a member of this congregation who spoke to me of a fear of asking too many questions. I know several among you have had this same experience, or if not for yourself, maybe someone else you know has told you of their experience. Churches have gotten a bad rap for being a place where you're not supposed to ask too many questions, right? Here's what we believe. Memorize it, learn it, believe it, don't question it. But Jesus himself seems to provide a different model for us throughout his teaching and ministry. I have this book in my office called Jesus is the Question by Martin Copenhaver. He's counted all the times in the gospel stories where questions are asked. From these records that we have in the Bible of Jesus' ministry, other people ask Jesus 183 questions. The number of times Jesus gives a direct answer back is in the single digits. Most of the time, he responds by telling a story or asking back another question. Jesus himself, throughout the four Gospels, asks 307 questions to those around him. I love when people ask questions in church because it shows that you're thinking. We're all on this journey together, wondering and wrestling and just trying our best to figure things out. When I think back over all the years of all the questions I've been asked, I think especially of the younger ones in our midst, of our children and our youth. Children are good at questioning things that most of us grown-ups have either forgotten about or taken for granted. So I think back on all the questions that I've been asked, and I think the one that I have heard the most frequently over the years is this. Why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus die? That shoots right to the heart of our faith. Why did Jesus die? The simple answer is that Jesus died for our sins, but like everything in life, it's also much more complicated than that. Yes, Jesus died for our sins, but he also died because he was speaking out against the people who were in positions of authority. Jesus called people to reorient their lives toward God. And the people in power, both the rulers of the government and the religious leaders, didn't always like that message. 
They didn't like the way people started listening to Jesus and not listening to them. They didn't like the way that Jesus was helping people break free from the structures that had kept some people at the top and others at the bottom. So our story that we hear today, that one that I just read from John 11 of the raising of Lazarus, this story is actually the first instance in the Gospels when we hear of the authorities trying to stop Jesus. The last line that I read for you was this, verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But the story continues in verse 46. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, what are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everybody will believe in him. And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. All of the things that Jesus has been doing, healing people of their illnesses, curing their diseases, feeding the hungry, forgiving people's sins, and teaching them about loving God and one another, the word is spreading about all of these amazing things, and the authorities are worried about Jesus and his growing popularity among the people. And now Jesus is even raising people from the dead. A few verses later, in that same chapter of the Gospel of John, we hear this. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. This is, it seems, as the raising of Lazarus, Jesus' most significant miracle. This is a turning point in his ministry. Some who witness this raising of Lazarus are moved to faith. They saw it and they believed in him. And for others, this is the moment when they know this man must be stopped. We cannot let him carry on like this. We need to find a way to end it and soon. What's especially remarkable about this miracle, though, isn't just the amazing thing that Jesus has the power to do. It's also the power that he gives to the others who are there. When Jesus raises Lazarus, he shouts, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, the text says, still all wrapped up in his grave clothes. There's a whole crowd of people gathered around. Some perhaps have just come to see what's happening, but many are there as mourners. They've seen Mary and Martha weeping over Lazarus' death, and they are there weeping too. They are grieving and mourning this loss too. So Jesus turns around to this crowd of mourners and says to them, Unbind him! and let him go. Lazarus is alive now, but he still needs to be freed from what is binding him. Jesus turns around to those mourners who are gathered there, and he expects them not just to participate, but also to complete this miracle that he has started. Jesus is the one with the power to do the miracles, to heal, to feed, to restore, to bring to life, to redeem. But rarely in the gospel stories does he do it on his own. He involves us, expects us to complete the work that he has started. Most of you probably know something about the St. Louis trip that we take with our confirmation youth. It's been delayed a couple of years now because of the pandemic, but typically over the summer we take our 7th and 8th graders and spend four or five days touring the city of St. Louis and neighboring areas, learning about different mission projects and helping organizations there. 
Nearly everywhere we go on the trip, the places that we visit were started by churches. Regular people just trying to figure out how to live faith in their lives, how to follow Jesus' encouragement to bring others into new life by unbinding the things that have held them captive. One of my favorite stories that I've learned on the St. Louis trip over the years is about the Reverend Louis Nolau. Pastor Nolau was born in Germany in the year 1810. In the 1850s, he was sent as a missionary to the United States, where he became pastor at St. Peter's Evangelical Church in St. Louis. Shortly after Pastor Nolau arrived, St. Louis suffered several epidemics and fires that killed 20% of the population of the city. Children everywhere around St. Louis were orphaned and living on the streets. Reverend Nolau came to his church, St. Peter's Evangelical Church, and suggested that they start an orphanage to care for these children in their community. One church member protested against the idea and said, but pastor, we don't have what we need to start an orphanage. I can imagine the list of concerns. I'm sure you can too. We don't have the space. We don't have the staff for this. We don't have the money. We don't have what we need to start an orphanage. But Pastor Nolau responded, yes, we do. We have an orphan. So on January 20th, 1858, Reverend Louis Nolau and St. Peter's Evangelical Church started an orphanage with just one orphan boy living in the church parsonage. Originally called the German Protestant Orphan's Home, that one orphan boy in the parsonage grew quickly to 50. Less than 10 years later, they moved the orphanage to its own space and took over 300 children in inside their walls, teaching them how to farm, how to cook, how to read, and all the other skills that they would need for a good life. In 1954, the German Protestant Orphan's Home was renamed into the Evangelical Children's Home, or ECH for short. Over time, the program has continued to grow and develop, evolving to meet the needs of the children and youth in St. Louis. Now it is called Every Child's Hope, and the organization helps more than 1,400 youth every year through programming that includes a residential treatment facility, a high school, an early childhood education center and daycare, outpatient psychiatric services, and transitional living and case management for children who are in St. Louis foster care. Through Every Child's Hope, the children and youth that they serve are given a chance for new life that is nothing short of miraculous. Every day, the staff and volunteers at Every Child's Hope and countless others who support their programming in endless ways follow Jesus' instruction to that crowd, unbind and set them free. Closer here to home, there are so many local miracles that have this same community effort. I think of Hope House and the Haven, which provide shelter and food and so many other resources to individuals and families who would otherwise not have a place to live. I think of the Miracle League, which provides athletic opportunities and a team and relationships and just plain fun to youth in our community who would otherwise not be able to play a sport. I think of the Two Rivers Ecumenical Food Pantry, I think of painting pathways. I think of the school's magic closet. There are so many local organizations that have this level of community involvement. And then there's the smaller things. 
the ways that you provide a listening ear to a colleague or a neighbor who is struggling, the, way, the ways you reach out to and pray for others within our own church community to encourage and support one another. This list is certainly not exhaustive. All of these things, big or small, are miraculous things that God is doing in us, with us, and through us. God, through Jesus, starts the work of new life after mourning, and then turns to us and says, unbind them and let them go. What other miracles are out there waiting for us to pick up and finish the work? Will you pray with me? God, we praise you. For even in the dark moments, you are with us. Even in the moments of grieving and mourning, even in the moments of confusion, even in the moments of anger and hurting and pain, you God are with us. Walk with us through those shadowy times in our lives. Help us hold on to hope for your future, for your tomorrow when the sun will rise and we can feel warmth and love again. We thank you, God, that through you, our mourning turns into dancing. That you take off our grieving clothes and put onto us robes of joy. And that you not only do that for us, but help us to do that for our neighbors and our community. God, we know just as Jesus we heard from Jesus this morning, we know that you hear all our prayers. You hear the prayers that are spoken aloud and from the silence of our hearts. And so we lift to you this morning those in our community who are especially in need of your prayers. And we pray for Jim Taylor as he nears the end of his life. We pray for his daughter Joyce and for all their family. God, may you surround them in love and care as they sit in this fragile place. We thank you, God, for this community, this place of love and care that although we are not perfect, we come together as best we can in praise of you. Hear us, God, as we join our voices with one another and with your churches and your people all over the world and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Have you ever wondered why the doxology follows the offering? Doxology comes from the Greek doxologia, meaning words of glory. It follows the acknowledgement of praise. Seen this way, this offering is an act of praise to God. It is through this offering that we honor God. Let us be generous in our praise to God. The offering will now be taken.
Please join me in the offertory prayer. Generous God, each week when we worship, we pray the words, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. May the gifts we share today for the furtherance of your kingdom help to accomplish your will in this world. May what we give continue the work of Jesus, providing food for the hungry, comfort for the grieving, healing for the suffering, and freedom for the oppressed. Amen. You may be seated. In the United Church of Christ, we practice what we call open table communion, which means all are welcome. The table of bread and cup is now to be made ready. So come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often and you who have not been for a while. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed. Come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We offer you praise, dear God, and hearts lifted high for the communion of your love. Christ comes to us, and we come close to Christ. With the whole realm of nature around us, earth, sea, and sky, with all the saints before and beside us, with kindred in faith from all corners of the earth, we join in the song of your unending greatness. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is our brother Jesus, who walks with us on the road of our world suffering, and who is made known to us in the breaking of the bread. On the night of his arrest, Jesus sat down to eat with his disciples, and he took bread, and having blessed it, he broke it. And he shared it with them and said, this is my body given to you. In the same way, after they had eaten, he took wine, and after having given thanks to God, he poured it out, and he gave it to them and said, this cup is the new relationship with God sealed in my blood. Take this and share it. Hear us, O Christ, and breathe your spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup. May they become for us your body, vibrant with your life, healing, renewing, and making us whole. And as the bread and cup which we now eat and drink are changed into us, May we be changed again into you, bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh, loving and caring in the world. Amen. He whose table was open to all is now present in this bread. He whose words welcomed friend and stranger offers friendship through this cup. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Come, for all things are ready.
I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. Living God, in this sacrament we have shared in your eternal kingdom. May we who taste this mystery forever serve you in faith, hope, and love. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. this morning. As you go from this place, take these words with you. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render unto no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of us all, be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. And all the people said. Yes, let's